I am delighted to welcome Director Sarah Gavron. Hi. Associate Director Anu Enrique. Hello. Actor and newly announced BAFTA Breakthrough Brit, Buki Bakre. Hey, and casting directors, Lucy Pardy and Jessica Straker. Hello. Hello. Welcome all. How are you all? Good. Thank <laughs> um, So let's just let do a deep dive into kind of how this film was made. It was made in a really unique, unusual, but perfectly collaborative um, way and not in any kind um, of traditional way in normal filmmaking terms. Um, Sarah, if we start with you, I believe kind of one of the co-writers, Teresa Ikoko, it was her story and her idea to kind of do something that was based in London around kind of teenage girls. Um, but without having a traditional script put in place. Um, how did you become involved? Yeah, well, so actually early on, um, I was having conversations with Faye about doing a, Faye Ward, the producers, one of the producers, about doing a project around teenage girls. And we, but we knew that we needed to build it with young people and we wanted to build it. So Teresa Rococo came on at an early stage along with everybody you see on the screen, <laughs> except Bookie. So we reversed the normal order of doing it because we decided to find our, do research, which Lucy can talk about, and find our cast before coming up with the story. So actually what happened it, it, is that Teresa and Claire, the co-writers, came into workshops, which we can talk about, and um, worked with people like Bookie and uh, lots of other young people. And out of that came um, the characters and ideas. And then Teresa had been working independently on this narrative, which she describes as a love letter to her sister. So she brought that narrative shape to the room, pitched it to all of us, and we felt that all the material that the girls had come up with and the ideas that we, the creative team had had would fit really well with her narrative story. So then Teresa and Claire wove that into the script that became the film. Um, so yeah, so it's a rather complicated and as you say, unusual way of going about it, but really casting was the first thing we started with. So on the subject of casting then, Lucy and Jessica, um, what's it like casting without a script and is it like was it something really exciting and kind of just a different way of working to have you have before no so it wasn't that different to the way that I've worked before um, it was probably the most kind of extreme and unorthodox version of it but I um, quite often work with filmmakers from a relatively early stage just because um the projects that I work on tend to specialise in finding um, people who maybe don't have any experience in the industry or on screen. Um, and that process does take longer. Um, so it was great working with Sarah in this way. So we were kind of huddled in the back of classrooms. Um, I think Bookie thought we were Ofsted for the longest time. <laughs> Because we were just in the corner, like chatting to people. And also, I think Bookie thought I was terrible at my job because I was always looking at my phone. <laughs> you were taking notes. Well, I was taking notes, but I think she thought I was playing, I don't know, Candy Crush or something, just <laughs> bored in the corner. Um, so, yeah, but like the, the joy of this project is that it was baked in that we were going to be taking as long as we took. And then, kind of, how is that, you know, in the process of finding? Kind of stuff. Oh. You're back, yay! Um, a, a prize, the process of finding um, a cast this time around, of predominantly for the most part, non professional actors. Um, can you talk about kind of just a little bit of the uh, intricacies of how you do that? And then, how another layer of it, obviously, for the most part, it being children as well? Um, we have to work really really closely with places that work with young people 
Um, so we we had to foster really, really good um, transparent relationships with schools and youth service. Sadly, there's not as much youth provision as there used to be. Um, but, you know, that was that was, again, something that, that we established from the very start. And um, so we can only be as good as our as our access. And luckily, um, even though by the time we got to doing a big um, casting search, we actually only had four weeks until until the end of the school term, we were able to go into numerous schools and it was this kind of mad scramble of me standing in front of whole year groups um, and inviting people to come forward for, for a casting that would happen in the summer. Um, and so that way, I think we invited um, over 2000 girls to come forward. And um, Jessica and I, Jessica came on board that, that summer to, um, helped me wrangle thousands of teenagers um, and Jess we saw about um, 1300 didn't we? Yeah around that I feel like it was more but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was we sort of gave everyone who sort of Lucy had encouraged everyone who came forward had an opportunity to audition just because it could have been their first and only and for a lot of them it was their first and only um, opportunity of this kind and um, we knew that we could make it a really open and safe environment just because auditions are scary in general and so if you've got that initial first lovely seeing us like chaotically running around then you know um, it might it might make some of those um, those people who we've come across go up for something else in the future that they wouldn't have. And I imagine a lot of the casting has to do with kind of with chemistry between kind of, you know, the actors involved. And so how can you um, work kind of the parameters of casting in this way, but then also trying to kind of really hone it in on chemistry, kind of Bookie and Kosar who are um, play the better and kind of that chemistry is so believable and so real. Um, maybe I'll come to you, Bookie, now kind of working with Costa. How did you, do you've got any insider tips of kind of building um, how that relationship seems so authentic on screen? How did you work together? Um, I think, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to write. No, no. So did you, yeah, how much time did you have like kind of together before filming even began? To be honest, the first day I met Colsa, it was as if I was meeting up with a friend I already knew. And um, I like, I have to give everything to Colsa um, and her energy and what she gives. Because um, I feel like I'm a really, I'm really like awkward and reserved person, but Colsa, like the way her energy is, she's like, she's so loving and she's so, um, welcoming and open and like yeah the ladies always say that everyone's energy was infectious and I feel like Kosa's one was so infectious for me because I just felt so um I just felt so like naturally like happy to be around her it was weird um because I never really I've never really experienced something like that when it comes to friendship so when I met Kosa it was like like this person is this person is mad cool like I want to be I want to be good friends with this person and um yeah that's that translated when we were filming because um she made like everything just so chill and she was present all the time and that goes for the rest of the girls as well they were just so present but it's easy acting is difficult but when you're acting with people that are so amazing it makes everything much much easier than it's it, that you intended it to be if that makes sense but yeah it does, like, it does seem it seems so natural kind of all of the conversations all your interactions kind of everything just seemed that it was just you know so fluid and yeah. natural um Anu, if I can come to you um what is an associate director <laughs> not the first time I've been asked this question surprisingly <laughs> Um, well, I think it's a reflection in a similar way. I think that like, I don't know if I can speak for Jessica, but the kind of associate roles um, in casting and then like on the directing team is that um, from the beginning, Sarah and Faye wanted to like create a team 
um, that respected like different perspectives and expertise and was also like supportive of people coming into roles for the first time. So it's the first time that I'd worked this closely with a director like Sarah or any director. And I think for Jessica, it was the first time working really closely with um, a casting director like Lucy. And I remember having long conversations with both, Lu both Lucy and Sarah throughout the process about like how you flatten hierarchies and how you like bring people onto teams in a way where you're not just like extracting information because they're useful because of their like um, their community or because of their um, like where they're from or who they're like mates with or whatever but because that is like a real expertise especially on a project like this which was working like very collaborative collaboratively with communities um, and also respecting that like our experience may not have been in film but we had experience as youth workers or people who like we all run at different organizations and work outside of the film industry as well and how that would be really useful as part of this process so it's kind of a testament to the heads of department in this case of like recognizing that work as not just assistant work but as part of like a real team um and like yeah so i think it's yeah a testament to to these women who made sure that that was like reflected in our credits as well Sarah, you've always, I think, whenever I've seen any interview that you've done about this, I've always said that this has been kind of such a purely collaborative experience and kind of every single person has had kind of their um, kind of their input and their own and just has been a very different and unique way, like I said at the beginning for you to make the film. So I just wanted to get then into the kind of making of the actual film. Um, you've got clearly all of these really enthusiastic young performers, um, which is phenomenal, but there might have been um, an element of trying to kind of rein them in in some way. And um, how, how, did you, how did you do that kind of, how did you kind of create the safe space that they needed to be able to, you know, really fully kind of live their roles, but also at the same time make a film? Well, there were so many layers to that because you know we'd done this year's workshop it was almost a year I mean we met Bookie um, at least a year and a half before we shot so we really really had established relationships um, Lucy and Jessica were doing masses of groundwork Annie was getting to know them and the writers were getting to know them so there was a lot of trust being built up there was also Amina Ayab Allen who was one of the producers who was forming relationships with all the parents and the carers around the the young people and all the supporting cast. And then we, you know, we brought in, we had a second AD called Melinda Carr, who was working very closely on set with Emmanuel, um, the character Emmanuel played by, um, oh my God, I'm having a terrible blank, little Emmanuel played by D'Angelo. Yeah. And he, um, so, so we had all these kind of support networks around us. So my job then was so much just about being on set and responding in a way to what everybody was bringing. And that's why I kind of feel like I've got to credit everybody more than you would even normally. I mean, all film is collaborative, but this felt particularly collaborative because so many people were having so much input and putting so much hard work in. Um, and so, and the young people themselves on set were taking so much responsibility for their own characters and their own roles and decisions about how to express themselves. And so it was, you know, it was about creating a, as you say, a kind of safe environment and that, you know, film sets are kind of unwieldy and pressured and complicated. And so it wasn't always perfect. And, you know, Bookie knows it was tough at times and she was doing very long days, but we did do things like, um, well, we had a predominantly female crew, 75%, um, if not more on set um, and lots of heads of department and right through the camera team were all female. We did have a male sound recordist um, who was very adept at kind of radio miking everybody and working around, but we had female boom ops and um, just a lot, a lot of younger women on the crew and women from different backgrounds. And we hoped that that meant that the um, artists and supporting artists in front of the camera could look behind and think, oh, I could maybe one day be a boom op or a costume designer or a makeup artist or a writer or a director or producer or any of those roles because they were there to sort of set the examples. Um, and then we also did things like, um, which is kind of a well-tested technique of people like Andrea Arnold, who Lucy's worked with and Shane Meadows and many other directors who've worked with um, at first time actors of running two cameras and um, also not saying action and kind of create and doing very, very long takes and allowing the performers to move very freely in a kind of 360 space. 
So, you know, it was a number of things that contributed towards making them feel that they could um, relax in the environment. There was such a lovely natural fluidity to the whole thing that kind of seems that, yeah, it was it's a very naturalistic environment to be in. Um, talking of kind of uh, uh, crew and the cast being involved kind of in both sides on and off camera, um, I'd like to kind of step, go back a little bit to the writer's room process because unlike, I believe, other films, um, you had more of, a, again, a collaborative writer's room experience. And Bookie, I know that kind of you were involved in that along with kind of the other cast as well. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, it was wonderful. It was it was really nice to be listened to. And uh, like you always, you always see writer's room. I always thought of it as like an American thing. And it seemed pretty cool to me, like everyone with their, their notepads and their coffees, just like, talking about um, ideas and stuff but like with the with the pens on the ears and all of that like so to be like <laughs> to be in a room with such amazing women just doing that in actuality that yeah it felt really cool to me um we, everyone would like interject their own anecdotes and seeing that um seeing money put into those ideas and seeing them manifested that was really cool um I, I can think of several things that we said that felt stupid but the ladies took it on and they um and they they would never ever make you feel like anything that you said was was silly or was wasn't worth saying so that was such an uplifting um and amazing experience yeah I, would, I loved it I want to do it again definitely I'm sure you will I'm sure you will very very soon um in terms of um kind of that experience of um having involvement with the script, I suppose for kind of maybe this is for everyone as well, how much of it changed from just the initial kind of ideas of it and even through the, the writing process to when you're actually filming with the bits that um, came out and then if they were kind of new angles or the cast went in a different direction, how did you adapt to that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucy, you say. So one of, and this actually will, um, is going to segue to, to Jessica's enormous contribution to this project because we um, we were told about the character of Emmanuel. Um, he kind of developed quite late into the process. So we had four weeks to find him. And four weeks to street cast anybody is like, if somebody had come and said to me, like pitched a project to me and said, yeah, and you need to find that one of the leads in four weeks, I would have told them to get lost because it's just impossible. But activate Jessica Straker and the impossible is possible. Go on, talk about, talk yeah. about that amazing bit of casting. I, I set me up like that, I was gonna <laughs> crash. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, we didn't have much time um, and so, yeah we sort of I've got a background in like social media and advertising so that came in handy sort of activating um sort of mums networks um sort of black black um Facebook groups um and it just sort of started sp spreading we were looking for a little brother as we were calling it at that point um and yeah so then we we saw about god like 500 little boys in the space of over two weeks and Anu um, came and helped and we were um, did a lot of improvising with um, at first it was groups of boys with Lucy where she was just sort of slowly deteriorating <laughs> every hour more children it's just like something you can't do now but um, and then we sort of managed to filter it down by the second week um, to sort of um, Se separate sort of improv scenes with me and Anu and Lucy where we pretend to be tired mothers <laughs> and on the bus and so on and just sort of testing them in a really like casual way where maybe they might not have been privy to um the you don't just don't want to add them add this level of um uh, pretense that would make them sort of shy away and break just sort of get scared and stuff so it was just making it feel really like playful um and just be like oh what would you do if like your mum wanted to go to Asda and things like that so um 
so yeah, it was mainly through social media, and then we did go into schools a few um, a few schools. We couldn't go into as many as we would have usually, like um, at the start um, for the main sweep. So we went into like a couple of schools that we already had connections with, and by chance um, found um, Emmanuel, which is D'Angelo twice. Um, managed to walk into his school, but he'd also his mum. Um, his mum had also um, submitted him as well, so that was, <laughs> and he was just, he just shone, he just shone, he shone. He uh, is incredible, I mean, how old was he when you made the film? I think he was seven, wasn't he? He was seven, oh, yeah. Yeah, he was oh. seven, and Anu was actually in the room when he came in and yes. was, was playing the tired mum and the the crucial thing with him well with all of the kids is we we knew that because of the way that the film was being made we needed to find a, a a boy who had really vivid interior life it needed to be somebody who really had a big imagination um and anu was playing the the tired mum and he led her in a guided meditation and mindfulness exercise My um, just off his own bat and we all left just going like whether or not we cast him we would like him in our lives because he has such such good vibes <laughs> it was amazing I'm just, that's an oh, example sorry. of like when we like we wouldn't have known that would be as part of the film and the b and b scene between rocks and emmanuel the reason he does the guided meditation and that is because of the improvisation that lucy led on um and so like an example of like how massively the cast like influenced what we what was in the script and then also what ends up on screen like we couldn't have known any of that if it wasn't for D'Angelo the actor or Bookie the actor. Do you have any younger siblings Bookie? <laughs> I actually don't I've always wanted I've always wanted a younger brother. But you you played the older sister extremely oh, well. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Um, how was it kind of working with a much younger actor and kind of what did you do together to kind of build that relationship on set? Um, how I've, I've always wanted a younger brother, younger brother, sorry, but I'm not really good with kids. Um, at, when we were doing the, the chemistry test with, with D'Angelo, it was me and Kosa and Kosa was just bond bonding much better with him. I was like, oh crap, I'm not going to be able to do this. Like, But um because again, like I have to give all the accolades to D'Angelo because of his energy and how generous he is. Like you can't not be, you can't not feel like wholesome when you're around him. So um, I think because I got that attachment to him, I kind of saw myself in D'Angelo um, and I had developed a relationship with him and his mum. And um, so when filming, it was like, yeah, this person is my blood now. Like I, I feel attached. I feel protective and I'm protective over everything I have. So once I had that connection, it was it was easier to um, to act. Yeah. yeah, it does make sense, complete sense. Um, and on that then, Sarah, um, I know we've touched on it before, but you've worked with obviously seasoned seasoned actors um, who you know who do this, um, who've done it many many times. Um, how different was this? It, experience and kind of um and do you think it's something that now will change your way that you make films in the future it was very very different because um you know we were allowing so much freedom in terms of the staging and the dialogue and there was such a lot of there was a huge feedback loop so Anu was by the monitor um feeding back what was working as were a number of the creative team and the writers and so and, and the cast themselves were, you know, feeding back. I mean, I've told this story before, but there was one scene where Kosar came up and went, this is just the, the way it's playing out, Sarah, it's just dead, it's totally dead. And you know, we, we went back and we did reshoot a lot. So they were definitely not mincing their words and giving very straightforward feedback. And if they felt something didn't feel right to them, they'd say it. And we were really tuned into that because it was really important that they felt that it was authentic and true to them and they, they could inhabit each moment beat by beat. Um, it was very different in, also in terms of doing these very long takes. And, you know, I was talking a lot through the takes and they were talking back to me. So it was a kind of, especially with D'Angelo, there was a constant, what would you do now? Where are you going now? Oh, why, what do you want to, were you going to say something? You know, so it was, 
and you know and I was like hiding under tables and never by a monitor always sort of moving around practically in the shot and um, just keeping slightly out of it so it was a very kind of intimate and engaged almost like live theatre process in that way and rather than standing back and letting the same take play out and you know and, and setting it and we were filming rehearsals and allowing it to evolve so really Maya Maffioli when she edited it was a massive feat because no take was the same um, there was, you know, I mean, normally I'd sit in an edit and you'd go through nine takes of Kerry Mulligan and you say, ah, oh, the eighth is the best, you know, and this you go through nine takes, everyone would be wildly different. So you can possibly, you know, make a decision. It together. Yeah. So, um, but it was, you know, for that, it, that made it really exciting and energizing and creatively alive. And I really enjoyed that. And I just think that it sort of, you know, it, 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 it was, it was the, in a way, it was more exciting to me because if I look at a scene, I can't attribute any single thing in it to one person. You think, oh, that came from that and that came from this and that evolved out of that. And that, there's something really exciting about that, that it became more than you could ever imagine. It could have gone in a hundred different directions. And I'm sure you've got enough to tell kind of a hundred different stories. Yeah, and I was wow. very nervous, you know, all the time. I, mean, I would go back, Maya was editing in my house and I would go back each night after shooting for, you know, whatever the, the day was. Luckily, the day was shorter than most shooting days because of the kids' hours. But I'd go back and spend two or three hours with her in the evenings and all Saturdays she'd work so that we could pour through what was there and examine whether or not we were getting it. And that was a kind of nerve wracking process, but also very, very useful in terms of kind of constantly calibrating the way it was going and then the conversations with all of these people who were you know constantly I felt a guide and it's kind of you know feeding back. Um, it is a, a kind of in terms of the aesthetic and it is a love letter to London and definitely a part of London that we don't often get to see reflected on camera kind of a truer London and that's also not only done obviously with the really impressive kind of cast but also done with the way the film looks, how much of that did you have to kind of then plan and think out in advance of, you know, you know, obviously fluidity and flexibility in terms of kind of script and perhaps direction, but how much was fluid in terms of location? And Well, it was a tall order for the team. I mean, Annie can perhaps talk about that because the producers, you know, had to, and we had some great um, producers assistants like Wada Mohammed, and she was working with Amina and there were people who were, allowing us to shoot in chronological order which in a shoot like this is really really tough because you're into a school you're out of the school we had sometimes you know 200 essays or maybe not quite 200 maybe we had 100 essays but they were all young people they all had chaperones it was a logistical huge challenge this film I have to say on on not a big budget you know and so we did plan locations but we also um, allowed a bit of flexibility and went back into things. Uh, but the chronological thing was the, the biggest challenge, I think, because we wanted everybody to be able to, we wanted the young cast to be able to shoot in order, which I think really, really helped from the storytelling point of view. Definitely. Um, is that something that you've kind of, I know that maybe Bookie was this, your first role, but um, did it help kind of help your character development kind of being able to do this in a in order? Yeah, definitely. I def like I didn't even know that's not I thought that was the orthodox way so hats off to actors that have to just do everything in them um, that's not in chronological order like that's still mad to me but um yeah it definitely helps like the scene where rocks um the food fight scene where she does the madness <laughs> I can't, it, it felt natural to do that as a character because of the stuff that happened beforehand so like those kind of climaxes and the emotions and the feelings and everything it was either, I was basically living as rocks for seven weeks, seven, eight weeks. So um, yeah, it definitely helped. It's a shame that that's not how it can be, but I understand now that it's it's really cost efficient to to obviously not film in that way. I mean, that's really interesting actually saying that you were living as rocks for kind of that period of time. How much to kind of, as even your first role, how much of that could you then at the end of the day off the shooting finish, how much of that could you let go of and become Bucky again or did you kind of did did it kind of remain quite constant all the way through being rock I would say like 50-50 um I mean I didn't 
because it was like long days I wasn't able to like come home and like just chill with friends and stuff I didn't have the normal summer so it was it was almost as if I was going home I was coming home to, to nothing just and having to do the next day so I would say that's why it was relatively constant but because it was such a um, like people watch rocks and think it's um like Rox's character was um was really upset all the time but that's not that's not how it is that's not how um that's not how it felt because um I feel like people really think with young when stuff happens with young people they sit with the hurt but a lot of the time people become desensitized and stuff like that just floats at the back of your mind and they don't let like trauma sit with them they let they let humor sit with them like 20 bad things could happen to this is what I see in school anyway. 20 bad things could happen to a young person, but one thing that's really funny could happen and that's the only thing they remember because that's what they cl- that's what they clutch into and that's clutch onto, sorry, and I feel like that's how it was playing with playing rocks. Um like the fact that so much was going on and she was able to get lost in that food fight yeah. and have fun and not like sit in her feelings. So. Go and get go and hang out on that penthouse apartment. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It is good. There is a lot of humour in the film, which is great. And obviously, again, like you've said, it's completely um, naturalistic as well. You know, I can't imagine a teenager, you know, sitting with something in the same way maybe kind of an adult perhaps might dwell on it. Mm-hmm. Um, we have questions coming through, so let's see. Um, so this is from Hugh James, and he's asking, how did you finance the initial stage of workshopping without a script or a story? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bookie. <laughs> I'll I'll go. What's his name? Go on. You, you, Q, Q, yeah. You like there's there's obvious things like um the pull of Gavron's name, like let's be real. Um <laughs> there's also yeah, there's just the fact that it was backed by BFI. By channel, uh, not channel four. It was backed by BFI, and that sort of allowed. It was backed by Channel Four's Film Four. Sorry, my mind is. <laughs> um, yeah, those are big, big people with big money. Um, so yeah, um, our process, me and Lucy, um, it it's no more expensive in terms of rate and stuff than normal traditional casting. It's just because it go, durates for so long. That's where it starts to get more cost efficient, uh, cost, costly in that way. And it's hard to sort of navigate that with um, financiers who want to sort of <laughs> make sure things aren't getting too long. So um, I guess hopefully now this will show that there is a reason, there's a rhyme and reason to having it that long. It's because you're entering communities and places that have not, um, do not have the understanding as much as an industry um, agent will have just that instantness of like, okay, this is what we're doing, boom. You have to sort of guide people through and you have to do things in a longer way, similar to uh, filming in, um, yeah, filming in um, chronologically. But yeah, it's just, yeah. Sorry, (laughs) do you agree, Sarah? That's a really good answer and I think on this point it, it, it's something I really learned from this team, this casting team and Anu about working with communities because I hadn't done that much you know in, that, in the way that these guys had and how important it is to put in the time and do it responsibly and see it through and I think it's a good moment Lucy and all of you to maybe talk about Bridge as well just because that's been so impressive to me the way that you've kept the relationships going with the young cast. Well, it was certainly one of these things that I've cast a lot of first timers and actually um, I'm acutely aware of the fact that once a film finishes, you know, to be a professional working in the industry and to, to know when your next job is coming and things like that, that's one thing. But you always have this moment of kind of you, there's a come down after you finish shooting a film and it's for everybody. Sarah has it, I have it, Anu has it, Jessica has it, Bookie would have had it too. Um, but it's looking towards longevity in people's careers and and following the commitment through um, was something that that 
Jessica and I talked about a huge amount as a team when we were when we were working on the casting of it. Um, and while the film was being edited, it that conversation started to kind of spread amongst other people from uh, the production too. And together, we formed something that we now know as Bridge, which I'll let Anu tell you about. Well, so yeah, Bridge, like Lucia said, was set up by kind of a group of core women, just to, to name everyone, because I think name checking is important. So Lucy and Jessica, Teresa, Coco, Claire Wilson, um, the writers, Axa Hines, who we, well, actually I met originally at Platform and she was one of the key people that allowed us to access that youth space and supported us through that. But then also is the, was the outreach and participation manager at RADA and she's just changed roles, but she still works with RADA Youth. Um, and Wada Mohammed, who also worked on the, on Rocks. Um, and it was kind of like the, the, the idea coming from asking questions at the beginning about the short term support that we can give and then the long term support as Lucy spoke about and has now become a kind of growing organization that we hope will be able to partner with um, productions who are looking to do work with first time actors in a sustainable, respectful and like um, I don't know, yeah, in, like, yeah, res a respectful way that hasn't been done in the past because of what Lucy talked about with this dropping and so um, We've done that through various different kind of expertise that we all bring. So through um, going to um, theatre, like to getting tickets to like theatre and cinema and performances, doing workshops around different aspects of the industry, around casting, um, setting people up with um, agents where they need support and taking them through lots, like very um, uh, intentionally through the casting processes that'll be on in other films. Um, also things like, um, bringing other actors to talk about their experiences in the industry. Um, so it's like everything from like the small everyday stuff to the long-term like career building and asking big questions about what you what these young women want for themselves in the industry. And the hope is to be able to like partner with um, different productions and run workshops um, over, the, over the years that will be able to like support people short-term, medium-term and long-term. Does that kind of cover things, Jess, Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> And that's called the bridge, yeah. Just bridge, no that. Just bridge, and <laughs> if, and and if um, our audience at home wanted more details, where could they find that? www.wearebridgeuk.com. Is that right, Jess? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, we've, also got, we've also got socials, so that's another way that you can follow us. Fantastic! It sounds like incredible. Um, on that kind of in this sense of supporting kind of talent and actors and supporting them kind of through their career. On the other side, kind of behind camera, um, we've obviously talked about how unique this experience was and um, the flexibility and parameters that were set in place to allow that to happen. We've got so many um, people watching right now that will want to make their first film and their debut um, and want to make a film like this and kind of represent their stories authentically as well without having Sarah Gavron on board, what kind of, what advice would you give to those people if they wanted to tell a story and it to be their first film in this way, how could they make that happen without having, kind of having a standing at the moment in the industry? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lucy, you work with a lot of um, new, well, you, Lucy and Jessica, you've worked with a lot of new directors, haven't you? First time directors. Yeah, I think it's one of these things. That I think before you embark on telling the story, you should really interrogate like why you want to tell the story and why you want to work in a collaborative way. I think um, certainly, you know, if it's reflecting an experience that you have um, had or if it's reflecting something that, that feels like a reality to you, I think that that's a, that's a valuable thing, but um, I think you have to be ready for the kind of commitment um, and, and to see it through, you know, it, it's not a case of um, when you go in and, and you find people who've, who've not acted before, you're bonded for, for life and it's a joy, um, but you need to be absolutely ready um, and, and, and able actually to, to follow that relationship through. Um, I'd recommend people do it, but you should really sit with it. Um, uh, because uh, I think um, I think that you have to be careful that there's not a kind of um, uh, voyeurism or, or outsider 
looking in point here um and it certainly shouldn't be done because it's trendy or or anything like that you know it's it's we're all about trying to like redefine the structures <laughs> in this industry you know we're we're looking to the long term that that we're interested in in different ways of of filmmaking and telling stories and um you know the, the joy of this project has been in its flattened hierarchies you know i am a different filmmaker as a result of this project um and i'm going to take this project with me for the rest of my life and my career um so if you're ready for that go for it um i'd add um just thinking about how uh, a filmmaker can sort of create that without having that backing or that thing that might Influ influence people to be money, 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 money. <laughs> um, is you, you? There's nothing wrong with um, finding. There's some great actors out there who have um, who have like training, and there is nothing wrong with doing that. They can get to that realism, and it's also about can you, as a filmmaker, really work with someone who might not be able to um, hit things the way. You can just so think of it like a photographer with a model. You can you can do street photography, but if you models, the, the, the photographer just like goes like that, and the model knows exactly what they're doing. That's what trained acting can afford you. And so, if you don't have a big budget, it might make sense to just see who's out there. There's some really, um, especially as the as the pool is diversifying. There's going to be people who can hit that rawness that you're looking at on the street because they're from that street. So. There's that as well. Well, and there's also you can street cast within your own community. Like you, you have that auntie who's funny. You have that like corner shop person. You have this arts them. See if they can film. Like get, put the camera in front of them. See how they um, think. People love to think, and they'll want to help you as well. But try and pay them as well. But <laughs> but um, yeah, I think those are those are two routes you can go off in to try and like recreate this it doesn't need to be oh i need to find lots of money to find a casting director who can then go into these places for me start in the places you already have access to that's great advice um i think even martin scorsese did that in the late 70s with a documentary called italian american he just filmed his parents at home um, and it's brilliant it's genius can be found somewhere online if you just type it in <laughs> um, we've got loads of questions so um, Christopher Lewis is saying I'm fascinated to hear that the plot was woven into material created with the actors separately can you elaborate on this and give some examples of how you wove those two elements together so seamlessly well so um, I mean you know Lucy also and Jessica um, were and Anu very, very closely were um, across the story through its evolutions and its various iterations. And um, so, so they can speak as much as I can about this. But what Teresa came up with was the narrative story of a brother and a sister and brother whose mother left and then with the help of her friends. And she, so in terms of the plot points, um, they were from that. But in terms, you know, things like um, the Afrobeats class came because um, we had access through Lucy to Platform, which was this wonderful youth hub. And through that, we met um, the young actor who you see on screen, Afi, who plays Yawa. And she was very into Afrobeats. And we saw her in that class and it felt organic to the story to bring it in. So that was one of those influences. And um, Kosar and the idea of her being the best friend came because Lucy and Jessica had found this amazing young person. She was in the room with us and she formed a friendship with Bookie. Um, so she became, it could have been any number of different friends from any different cultural backgrounds who could have played that best friend, but because of their friendship, we responded to that. And she, then they wrote in the Somali family, British Somali family, and then Jessica and Lucy and, you know, went out and worked with those communities and found those people. And there are so many examples, aren't there? What, what else? I knew everybody helped me here. What were the other examples? Um, I was going to say that I think one of the central things is that because we have such a naturally talented actor in Bookie, that actually the story could have the emotional depth that it has. I know I've got loud mom energy right now, but I'm telling you, like, it's not many people. We saw, you know, we saw over a thousand people. When Bookie came in to her audition, 
it was very much helped probably because we'd met before but I wasn't I wasn't telling her really what to do she made a choice in that moment that she was going to go for it and she went for it and she continued to go through it throughout the entire process and it was a long process you know it was nine months and she grew like the most incredible flower I'm embarrassing you now but like there's not many teenagers who could have carried a story with that level of depth and that's Bookie so that's like Bookie sitting here giving everybody like compliments which is absolutely right but you know we have to give Bookie her flowers in this moment. And she's just been named a BAFTA breakthrough. I think probably one of our youngest ever BAFTA breakthroughs, in fact. So congratulations, completely deserved. Um, so Halima Abdulali is asking, um, how did you cast the families? I think you touched on that a little bit. Rox was the first time I saw a Somali family on screen. It made me and many young Somali people cry. It was, um, it was definitely a first and I really hope to see more. Um, I think, yeah, okay, Lucy and Jessica, what's great about, or astonishing about the casting is A, a really true reflection of London, but B, it covers so many communities and so many communities authentically. And were you really mindful of that when you were casting to make sure that kind of the spectrum of diversity that London has to offer is covered? We certainly weren't like um, casting to any kind of criteria. In, in that respect. It's just, we looked in places that are representative of London. So we looked in East London, we looked in North London. The thing that was staggering for, for me when I was approaching schools in Newham, for example, is none of those schools really had ever been approached by any casting person or very few of them had been, which was bonkers. Um, and actually, so our cohort of young people, our, our pool of young people were just Londoners and they're from all kinds of different backgrounds. Um, and so we weren't, we weren't doing a, a, a kind of criteria thing at all. Um, but then what we wanted to do when we had cast young people is we absolutely wanted to cast their families authentically. And again, magical Jessica Straker played a huge part in particularly um, spearheading the casting of Samaya's family. Over to you, magical Jessica Straker. Yeah, well, I also have to give um, a big shout out to Wada Mohammed, who it was a production assistant on his um, from his Somali herself as well, um, and she was really helpful in, in like going through her community and finding people as well. Um, but yeah, it was just we wanted, as as we said, we we let the we let the cast form, and then from that we formed, and so it. It just took different things. I, I don't know. I live in Tottenham. There's a big Somali community here. I just walked into like the uncle shop that um, was like, <laughs> does anyone want to act? And I went to barbers. Does anyone want to act? And I just kept annoying them until, <laughs> until they all gave me like, they all just give me this one person's number like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he does it. He does it. And I'm like, but I like you. And they're like, oh, he, he, he. So <laughs> we, we did it that way. And it was it was hard in the sense of like um, entering communities who haven't been um, approached before and when they have been showcased on television have been showcased in the wrong way as well so there's a lot of it was a lot of penetrating in that way but I'm sure my like chaotic energy <laughs> calmed that down but yeah it's just meeting people on their level and I think we definitely across all of the characters, um, especially all the adult characters, we wanted just that authenticity um, and not showing the type of, maybe like, especially from like the black perspective, um, there is a type of like um, film ready blackness that is very, um, that you're used to, that you see it everywhere, but there's it slightly differs from the actual blackness, a bit like Moonlight. Moonlight was the first time I saw um, black men that I knew in my family who I'd never seen on screen um, in that way. And so it's just showing that, just that slight tilt of like, oh, this is actually how we act when we close the door and we want to put these people in front. Um, so I think that was in my head, definitely, when we were looking. Um, and. Lucy, do you want to like touch on the teachers as well? Because that was that's a quite underlooked um, part, but really integral. 
Yeah, so Sarah, thank you, Jessica Straker. So Sarah and um, Sarah and I were talking about like we wanted to create a um, a sense of this kind of blurring of reality um, in terms of like how do we make a classroom feel like the classrooms we sat in on, and so we came up with the idea of casting real teachers, um, and. Of course, we had access to many, many teachers because we had been into so many schools and um, I've worked with schools for years. So there were some teachers like um, Tony, who plays the maths teacher who kicks Bookie out of the class. I met him like 10 years ago and I've always had it in my back of my head of like, oh, if I ever need a teacher. <laughs> and he absolutely smashed it. Like he was really, really great. And there's something about those scenes that by having real teachers, I think, was a little bit triggering for the young people and they went into school brain. Um, I don't know if that's true, Bookie. Did you find that working with the real teachers helped? Yeah, you can like, certain things you can't fake it. It just, you just felt like you were back in the classroom. As, as, at times, when I, not at times, when I got sent out, I kind of felt, I've been sent out many times, I'm a good student, but <laughs> at times, and it felt the same, so yeah. Did they also do the onset tuition in between filming? <laughs> yeah. We did have tutors. Yeah, yeah. So we could rope it all into kind of one big role. Um, Erica James is asking, you did something unique casting newcomers and those with no representation. What advice would you give to aspiring young actors that do not have representation but would like to book jobs like this? Um, I would say to start with um, following loads of um, casting directors on Twitter, if you have Twitter. Um, some of them are on, um, some of them might be on like Instagram, but we're quite old, so just join us on Twitter. <laughs> but um, yeah, there, there's lots of people posting stuff, so you can find that by like watching shows that you like and like waiting in the credits or going on imdb.com and looking and seeing who the casting director is and then googling that and typing them in they'll they all retweeting stuff so that's a good one anyone else unless it's someone like me because i don't i'm not on social media at all so by then just put your name um around a carrier pigeon's ankle and send it <laughs> in the sky and i'll find it because that's how i like to communicate with people i don't think this audience will even know what a carrier pigeon is I'm missing um, out people um and also like um going there's so many great like um you community places like stratford east theatre royal um platform hub in islington um then there's also there's like almeida in like angel there's oh gosh yeah, there's, like, royal Court. there's so many situations out there so like yeah just have a look um have a look about and see what there is because people will be approaching those places so even if you don't have agents if you're in a place that's nurturing you um opportunities will come from that and in terms of uh kind of getting a list of casting directors would you say the casting directors guild is kind of a good place to go to kind of get a list of kind of people or is the best way to kind of just like you've said Jessica look at stuff that you really like and you would want to be in and kind of just go through those credits and find details that way yeah I'd say that way yeah. you can do but I mean you can do both the the wonderful thing is like we've got all the answers in our phones so you know um going down a, an IMDB rabbit hole can be quite good but you know the the casting directors guild will also have you know some really amazing, incredible people too. Okay, let's try and get them through some, I've got lots of questions. We've got a question for Anu from Anna Keeley. It's amazing hearing the discussions about flattening hierarchies and rebuilding the structure of filmmaking, particular films with community focused stories. Could you share more about your work with Skin Deep and whether or how it overlapped with your work on Rock? Thanks, Anna. <laughs> it was almost like I said, it's not set up. Um, but um, yeah, so Skin Deep is an organization that I run like set kind of separate to the film industry, but there, like you said, there is like some, there was some really lovely overlaps with this project. 
Um, so Skin Deep focuses on working with black creators and creators of color who are working towards racial and social justice in some form of creative work. Um, and a lot of the like way that we work is very collaboratively, very like um, co-participatory in collaboration with communities who don't often get told they are storytellers um, or don't, but like, uh, yeah, the system is not set up um, to encourage them as storytellers. Um, and so it's about trying to find ways outside of the industry to challenge that and to um, create spaces where their voices are valued and their voices are uplifted and respected. And I feel like those, a lot of those ethos were overlapped with the way that um, the creative team was building this film. Um, and so I, th I think in that way, and there was like so many other people on the crew who brought experience outside of the industry, like Claire Wilson runs, um, one of the writers runs um, an organization called um, Welcome Cinema, where she works with um, refugee and asylum seeker communities to show films and host screenings along with food um, and do Q and A's. And Teresa has, um, has like years of work um, with young people who have been in the criminal justice system. And so all of that experience came became really useful as part of this and it's also like I think for a lot of us whose first filmmaking experience it was um, has been really useful in creating a kind of yeah a value system in what we want to take forward with future projects so there is um, things that we're working on all independently and and together again like we're working on a skin deep project um, about which is a an environmental justice documentary but will be built in a similar or like using some of the lessons we learned from rock so working with communities from the very beginning who have been working to do working in environmental justice work for like decades um, to build the story with them rather than having like a narrative or like a theme or something that you're imposing onto a community um, and it, it, it speaks to a lot of what like everyone on the zoom has already spoken to about like how much more time that is needs for that um, how much you need to like recognize your positions of like power and like privilege in those spaces and step back, um, often step back rather than stepping forward and stuff like that. Um, so I think, yeah, there is some beautiful overlaps and hopefully we'll carry forward into like other projects that we do together and separately. I do love how Rocks is, can, could, or hopefully is becoming kind of the framework to how to make great cinema. Um, so we have Jody Shields asking a question for Bookie. If you, ooh, if you could choose any characters to play, what would it be? Uh, that's, a, that's a question so hard. Um, I feel like, I feel like my character, a character that I would love to play hasn't been written. Um, I mean, I, I want to tell truthful stories, but um, I'm, I'm fascinated in that element of escapism and acting and jumping into realities that um, I'm not in close proximity to, but I, I can identify with them slightly. So, um, yeah, I'm, like, one of my biggest inspirations is Lakeith Stanford because of his range as, a, as an actor. So I'm, I'm inside, but to, let me not be too abstract and just answer the question properly. Um, I, would love to play a, I would love to play a lawyer or, um, to be honest, I just, I just want to be in love as a rock. <laughs> I want I wish I was in love with rock because I would literally, literally silly games is just in my head so if I'm not very present that's why yeah. but um yeah stories like that stories like just truthful things and escapism um yeah a lawyer or like an like a, an African warrior Someone, someone with like massive amounts of strength, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Do you think that um, you'll start writing as well after kind of your experience on rocks? That's something you're interested in? Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely interested in writing. Um, I see it as like a massive tool for, um, for acting. So yeah, I definitely want to write. Um, yeah, I'm inspired by these lovely ladies who write as well, so I just, that's definitely something that I want to do. And a lot of the time, this, the stuff I want to see aren't be, isn't being made. So you have to like write it yourself so it can be made. So yeah, I'm really interested in writing. I can't wait to watch it. Um, this is for Lucy and for Jessica. Do you have any advice for filmmakers who are looking to streetcast on a short film budget and schedule 
particularly for roles that couldn't be cast immediately from friends and family. Do it yourself. <laughs> the reason why I say do it yourself is because it takes a long time. And um, I think in being in the world yourself as a filmmaker, your idea of who you're looking for will change and it will probably deepen. Um, so consider it as part of the, de the, the development process. That would be my advice anyway, um, just because on a short film budget, in order to um, have a casting director um, come on board, it's a, it's a big commitment and you, you'll run out of road quite quickly, potentially. Um, so, you know, it will, it will um, enrich the project, I think, if you go on that journey. Would you um, suggest kind of doing call outs on social media? I mean, it depends who you're looking for. Um, sometimes call outs on social media are really effective and really appropriate, but sometimes they're not. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, a case by case basis. That's really unhelpful and evasive, sorry. Um, a question for Sarah. Do you think there are, there are an accept, sorry, do you think there's an expectation of what your next feature would now be? Um, after the success, success, oh, can't say that word, success of rocks. Um, how um, and how will you kind of navigate that expectation? Mm. <laughs> I think I need years of therapy to answer. I don't, it's, it's, <laughs> so it's taken so much um, making a film. You know, all of us have been so absorbed in this for so long, and it really is like bringing a child into the world. And there are million, so many parents, and um, and I've lived and breathed it for four years now. And it's very, very difficult to move on, I have to say. So, um, but I am thinking of ideas and my kind of guide is just um, thinking about I, things I'm interested in and things I believe in and things that feel um, worthy and important, uh, worthy of the screen and important to tell. And, you know, with Rocks, we, we all grew up not seeing women or young women at the center of our screens and certainly not seeing women like the women in Rocks. And that became one of the drivers. And I feel really sort of excited that you see the women you do in front of you on the screen and, and that they brought so much to it. So I'd love to have that feeling again but I don't know what will bring that feeling again but I'm interested in community I'm interested in different ways of working I love working with established actors and new actors and you know the whole range I love working collaboratively so um, I hope that I find a way to do it again we could just we could revisit rocks in five or ten years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and this is from Caitlin Jenkins. Were there any other filmmakers or previous works or other films that you've seen that kept that you kept in mind whilst working on rocks? I think that's a question for all of you. Yeah. Bookie, is it? <laughs> is there anything that you kind of seen before that kind of you drew on? This is gonna sound mad, mad, yeah. very egocentric, but um, no, nah, because it's nothing. It wasn't really anything like rocks to draw on. Um, I would say, like, actually, no, let me not even say that. A film called Divines, Divines, Sarah, like, made us watch it. I remember going to the Fable, Fable had some temporary offices, and I sat there and did my hair in preparation for, for shooting with Nora Roberts. And I watched Divines. And that was a beautiful, beautiful French film. I think, um, like, French films have a lot of these same like subject matters and themes. But besides from that, I kind of drew on other films that had nothing to do with like this experience. Like I, um, we watched Moonlight, I watched, I mean, I watched Boys in the Hood. I, I would try and make links, but obviously there was no links, but that's just my, my head. Like um, I would just, for me, it was about just taking what, I've seen and just trying to trying to make the links and trying to trying to apply apply and make it make sense in my head. Like I was watching Modern Family and Phil Dunphy, the, the dad in it, he said, I am he said I'm thinking, I'm thinking inside the box because everyone's too busy thinking outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how it kind of was with rocks. Um 
another actor, Jonathan Majors, he said, try not to be too clever with your inspirations and with the stuff and like all these kind of things. And I think us touching on things on a surface level to a degree allow like made way for um made way for it to just for our own ideas and our own like natural instincts and initiatives to come out because I feel like if we had if Sarah had gave us this long list of films and stuff to watch beforehand I would have just I would have um I would have did what I saw what I what I had been sorry subconsciously so it was I appreciate the the lack of um Freedom. Freedom, yeah. Um, let me go. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Let's see. Um, did you find it difficult to give to give up the rigid structures of what we think of as actor, director, cinematographer, casting director, writer, or was it a liberating process? This is for Anu. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's more for Sarah as well, I think. But I, <laughs> I think that there was like, yeah, a real generosity that I think it was a liberating process. I can't speak for, for Sarah. But um, for, for me, it was amazing to be able to work with someone so like openly and closely over a really long period of time. By the end of the project now, it's been we've worked together for like four years now um, on on this on rocks. And I think that by the end of it, it felt in some ways that we were like two halves of the same brain and thinking in very different ways. Um, but it was like a really, it's a nice process because it means everything that you question or think about or are wondering, you have someone that's like an immediate sounding board and a whole team that's an immediate sounding board. And, and like, I don't understand how that's, that's always gonna make your, the, the like the questions the project stronger because you have these very like unique and different perspectives um and like a space created where all of those perspectives are like listened to and valued so i think it was for me it was a liberating a great process and it's is how i'd like to keep working don't know about sarah though maybe she hated it <laughs> <laughs> no it was amazing it was hugely beneficial and i couldn't have done it without you know all these people um feeding in and the, all their wisdom and you know, perspectives and advice and thoughts and creative ideas. That was what made it what it is. Um, well, it is that. Uh, Lucy, did you want to say something? Sorry, I cut you off right at the beginning. If that no, it's sense. fine. I was just going to say that I loved it. Like to have a like a second head to my monster in Jessica Straker was just a dream come true. Um, and it's really funny because I've been having to think about like the process, and in my head, Jessica was next to me from the very, very start of the whole process, <laughs> um, because so many of these important, valuable, creative conversations were had, like, as we were, like, stuffing sandwiches into our mouths for, like, another horde of young people were coming in <laughs> to cast things. Um, and it, it's so valuable and it's so deeply creative. That was the thing about that was that really lit my fire for the for the whole process. Um, and I can't imagine working in. A, I mean, I've been very lucky. I haven't always worked on very conventional projects anyway. But this has kind of like hardened my resolve to continue working in this way um, because it's the best. Oh. I think we're close to coming to the end of this session. I just want to thank. You all, Sarah, Anno, Bucky, Jessica, and Lucy, um, for sharing the experiences of how this astonishing film was made. Um, I believe it is available to see on Netflix at the moment for those that haven't had a chance to see it already. Um, and I just to, for our audience at home, we've got a couple more sessions coming up for Bataguri Live. Our next one is tomorrow evening with the team behind the Sky Original. Um, bulletproof so tune in or book in for that um, thank you team rocks thank you